Okay, so Jane's item, item she was talking about, is uh, an example of a collection of original documents that were preserved. In that case, they were preserved because the official in charge, the Irish Chief Secretary, Castlereagh, took those documents away. Uh, again, the line between official and personal correspondence was somewhat blurry. But in Beyond 2022, we are interested in a range of different types of historical documents. And one type that's really important is transcriptions. These are documents which are not originals, but they are extracts, sometimes full transcriptions of documents that no longer exist. Uh, so it's important to remember that in the 19th century, when the Public Record Office of Ireland was first created, this new state archive was really a boon to a whole range of researchers, antiquaries, local historians, and genealogists. And many of these men and women were uh, just habitual note takers and transcribers. Um, if you've ever done a little research into your family history, you'll very quickly come across some big names in Victorian Irish genealogy. Um, while some of the names are better known, men like Tennyson Groves, uh, Thrift, the Swift Abstracts, Crossley, uh, some of these big names of you know, more than a century ago in terms of genealogical research. One example we have today is from a lesser known case, a man called Maxwell Given, whose notebooks and research notes are contained here in Prony. Now, Maxwell Given was born in 1886. Uh, he was a native of the town of Coleraine, and he spent his life researching the history of that town. Uh, he was a frequent visitor to the public record office in Dublin right up until its destruction in 1922. And indeed, he continued his research right through the 20s and 30s until his untimely death in 1934. And we have today one of the volumes of his notes. Uh, give, the given collection was actually um, um, donated to Prony in the 1990s. And one example, one volume today, shows you a great example of the range of different documents that Given transcribed and preserved, with many of the, orig of the originals now lost. So the first example we have here today is extracts from County Londonderry Exchequer Inquisitions. Now, the Inquisitions, Exchequer Inquisitions, were a type of treasury document. What they were was they were an inquiry, an inquisition, into what the rights and privileges of the crown over certain lands, when those lands were held by the tenant in chief. When a large landowner would die, the crown, through either the chancery or the exchequer, would basically establish what their rights in this case was. Now, this is a really interesting example because on this page, it mentions that the territory that they're looking at is the country of Okahan. This comes into the sort of the, the, the heart of the history of Coleraine. The Okahan clan were the rulers over much of the territory that is now modern day County Londonderry. In the 16th century, however, Londonderry did not exist as a county. It was known as County Coleraine, or sometimes colloquially known as Okahan country. Now, into the 17th century, um, the Okan clan fell out of favor with the royal government for many complex reasons, which would take very long to explain. The result being that what had been the Okahan country of Coleraine was um, changed. Sections of what had been County Coleraine were added onto with sections of Antrim, Donegal, and Tyrone to create a new county, County Londonderry, which would be the heart of the Londonderry plantation, obviously after 1613. So what you're seeing here on this page is not just a standard inquiry into legal rights over land, it's a document that's also at the heart of the Ulster Plantation. Now we have an example from the other end of the 17th century, from the 1690s. Now this is a document that Given transcribed from the Public Record Office in Dublin. You can see he's written it here from the diocesan collection. He even gives the bundle and the bay and shelf number. Now, these are papers which he's actually unsure of the dating, which is really interesting. You're getting an insight into how the researcher worked. He thinks it's either 1696 or 1694. But what it is, is an inquiry into the clergy, the, uh, the Catholic clergy referred to in the document as the Popish clergy, who are still living in the various parishes of the Diocese of Derry. And it actually gives a description of some of the priests, and in some cases, friars, who are still active in these parishes. Now, the context for this document is the era known as the Penal Laws. After the Williamite Wars of 1689 to 1691, uh, the outward demonstrations of the Catholic faith were either highly regulated or prohibited, 
and there was a series of civil disabilities imposed on the Catholic majority of Ireland. There was great care taken to understand and to monitor the Catholic hierarchy in Ireland, and this is one great example. But it also gives us a really interesting insight into some of the realities, the lived realities of religious practice in Ireland in the 1690s. And I'll choose just one example. In the townland of Cumber, it says, there is no popish priest yet lives in this parish, but mass is said there by Shane or John O'Cahan. Again, that name O'Cahan coming up. Uh, O'Cahan is aged about 56 years. He dwells in Bally Donegal, in the parish of Banner. He, he is exercising ecclesiastical jurisdiction by divorcing and declaring marriages void. He is uh, a most malicious, ill-inclined and designing man. So clearly whoever was doing this inquiry didn't have uh, a, a very high opinion of Ocan as sort of a secular quasi-priest. Now, the context of the penal laws and sort of the long 18th century in which Irish Catholics uh, suffered under, under these civil disabilities is also the context for the next item we're going to look at. Now, throughout the 18th century, there was a great anxiety amongst administrators and the government in Dublin Castle about the Catholic majority. Were they loyal? Could they be relied upon? Did they actually harbour loyalty instead to the exiled Catholic King James II, living in exile on the continent? For that reason, that anxiety about Catholic loyalties, there was a huge anxiety about great fear about establishing just exactly the numbers and proportion of Catholics to Protestants in Ireland. That, however, began to change towards the end of the 18th century. In 1766, the son of James II, the old pretender to the throne, died. And suddenly, there was a little bit less fear about a Catholic rebellion in pursuit of a Stuart monarchy. And not coincidentally, that very same year, 1766, the Irish Parliament commissioned a religious census. Now, the census was to be carried out by the Church of Ireland uh, clergy in the various parishes, but there were no instructions about what was to be included or about how it was to be carried out. It was simply stated that they were to ascertain the proportion or the number, raw numbers of Catholics and Protestants. We have an example of, from that 1766 census here in the given collection. Uh, there are many examples in other collections, but this one is in itself very interesting. You'll notice that although it gives you the numbers of Protestants and again, that term Papists, Catholics, it doesn't subdivide Protestants into Presbyterians or to members of the established church, the Church of Ireland. However, what it does do is again, like that previous example, give you notes on some members of the Catholic clergy who are active in the various parishes. So you can see here, again, the example of Cumber, one resident papish priest, two or sometimes three vagrant friars who don't reside, but often officiate here. Again, a little insight into the lived realities of religious life in uh, uh, Derry of the 18th century. One other example of a type of document that Given was really interested in transcribing were these printed proclamations. And again, you can see here volume seven of the printed proclamations in the record office of Dublin. Now he transcribed these in 1906. Um, now, thankfully, a good number of these proclamations survive, and there is actually a, a multi-volume edition by the Irish Manuscript Commission. A lot of these were reproduced in a thing called the Dublin Gazette, which is also a focus for beyond 2022. But this is nonetheless a really great example of the type of stuff local historians looked at in the early 1900s. They give a great insight, these proclamations. These are official proclamations from the Lord Lieutenant or the Lord Justices. They give you a little insight into how law and order was enforced in the early 1700s. Uh, proclamations against highwaymen, against agrarian redresser groups. This one example from 1719 is a proclamation stating that two men, Shane O'Haran and Shane O'Mullen, unless they turn themselves in by August of that year, 1719, if they haven't turned themselves in, then they will be charged for high treason for their crimes as highwaymen. Uh, a really great vivid example of the type of thing that was both in local history and folklore by the early 1900s. Now, not everything that Given transcribed would necessarily have found its way into the forecourts, and not all of it's gonna be necessarily the focus of a project like Beyond 2022, but nonetheless, it is still really rich. It gives you a great example of, once again, what local historians were interested in. So for example, 
Given was really interested in the history of printing in Coleraine. And one of the earliest examples he had of local printing was the printing of theater handbills, advertisements for local theatrical productions. You can see here he gives several examples from the year 1782. If you were living in Coleraine, you could take in a production of Othello as well as several uh, local farces, which he actually lists. He even actually sketches out what the handbill would have looked like. So we hear, see here two examples of lesser known plays, you know, Othello and Shakespeare, it's very well known. Here we have Midas and two other presumably farces, Busy Buddy and The Mock Doctor. So it's not always high theatrical fare. Now, this is the final example from Given's notebook that I want to show you. It is a sketch he's done from the down survey maps. Now, some of the down survey maps were destroyed in 1922, but other versions exist. This is one sketch he has taken from them. Now, interestingly, he actually gives a story about the nature and origin of this map that actually doesn't seem to be entirely true. But you can show how, even within this notebook, he's sketching out the little parts that are relevant to him. However, when it comes to that down survey, we are very lucky to have someone who's much more of an expert than me on those maps, and that is Dave Brown, who'll be the next people, person speaking today.